Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And I invite you to learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com, where you can also sign up for my daily inspiration email blast. And I will send you an inspiring email every weekday. But for now, The angels and I are here to help you come into a soothing, sweet time of rest. This podcast is a mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the beautiful angels and listening to sleep podcasts. I listen to a sleep podcast every single night and it helps me to shift from my waking consciousness into that beautiful mystery of sleep. And I love sleep podcasts so much that I have created this one for you. That said, you have my invitation to use this podcast in whatever way best serves you. I know some of you do use it as a sleep podcast, and if that is your intention, my suggestion is that you turn the volume down a bit lower than if you were listening to a regular podcast or audiobook. I find it helpful to have to reach a little bit to listen because it makes it easier for me to drift off. And because this is a sleep podcast, there will be no loud noises, no unexpected surprises. I will be sharing with you in this rambling, (laughs) soothing tone. So if you're thinking, wow, she's talking pretty softly and she's talking so slowly, Well, that's by design. This is not my natural timbre or rhythm. But it's designed to help lull you into a sweet space of rest. And if you're listening during the daytime and I get to keep you company as you go about your day, that's awesome too. So I invite you to get comfortable in whatever way best serves you. And to take some nice deep breaths in and out. So as I was preparing to record this episode, I was guided to pull an angel card from this very sweet oracle deck, which some of you may have. It's called the Original Angel Cards by Kathy Tyler and Joy Drake. And they're these little slips of cards. And I don't remember how many there are in there, but there's a lot. And each card just has one word and then a little drawing of an angel. And they're really sweet. And I ask the angels to, of course, come through. And what could I talk to you about? in this first part because each episode has two different parts. So this is the part where I bring in the angels and we talk about something inspiring or spirit infused. 
And then the second part is story time. So this isn't story time yet. This is the the inspiring, angelic portion of the podcast. So I pulled a card. And the word that came forward is patience. Now, I have a question for you. When I said that, did any of you join me in an inner eye roll or groan? (laughs) Because that's what happened to me. Patience. No, not that. But patience is the wisdom that is showing up for us right now. So let's dive into that a little bit and see what the angels want to share with us. So let me begin by inviting the angels forward. They're already here, but I love the ritual of sharing them with you, of asking them to join us out loud so that you can be present here with us as well. So let's take some nice deep breaths in and out together as we gently call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And I ask that you bring forward waves of love for each of our beloveds that are here with us now. And even as I speak this prayer, I hear a bird in the background that you may hear as well, rising up to sing the song of the angels with us as I record this. So angels, please bring forward light and healing, compassion, inspiration, and clarity in service to our beautiful friends gathered here with us now. So dear ones, just take some nice big deep breaths in and out. And I'm guided to invite you to imagine that the angels are transporting you to a beautiful healing temple that resides on the angelic realm. Just use your imagination if you'd like. I often visualize it as a huge golden temple, not man-made gold, but etheric, vibrational, divine golden light. The doors swing open and you are made welcome in this beautiful temple of light. And I love this visualization because it always helps me to remember that this light is always available to us. So just imagine, visualize, allow it to be so that you are being greeted by one of your beautiful angels. And they guide you over to a healing bed that has been prepared just for you. So while your physical body perhaps is reclined in your earthly bed, Your angels are bringing you to this beautiful bed in the healing temple and they will be bringing healing light to you as you sleep. And you don't even need to know what is up for healing. The angels will bring healing to whatever is for your highest and best good if they have your permission to do so. So if you do want to receive this, just say, yes, please. (laughs) You can say it silently. And just allow your physical body and your light body to receive this beautiful healing. There is so much beautiful light flowing to you now. 
The angels are aware of all that is transpiring for you. And they come forward now to help ease your path. To help bring forward a lightness of spirit for you. To bring forward the vibration of brighter tomorrows. And so you receive this energy and allow the love to flow in. And I'm going to invite the angels to share with us some wisdom about this concept of patience. And here is what they want you to know. So often on the earth plane, we identify our creations and our manifesting based upon our earthly endeavors. How hard are we working? How much effort are we putting into something? But co-creation happens multi-dimensionally. That there are times when you experience yourself in stillness where perhaps you're not doing something. And there can be this perception that you are being lazy. You're not working hard enough. But what I have come to learn is that often co-creation being in divine flow is often about learning patience because there are times when the flow of co-creation is more powerful than others. And I've learned to be patient sometimes, not always. For instance, Many of the classes that I offer are brought forward through inspiration and I have learned to wait and listen. It's not about me figuring out what to offer next. I'm a smart person. <laughs> I, I know how to figure out what to offer. But if I cultivate my offerings based on my will or my intellect, I find they do not have the flow they have when I make space to listen for divine inspiration. And the divine inspiration does not always come in my timeline. Or perhaps a better way to say that more often than I would like, I'm waiting. I'm doing the metaphoric toe tap waiting for the download to happen. But it always shows up. I'll share with you a beautiful metaphor that the angels teach about this concept of patience and co-creation. They say, imagine that you are a master surfer. You are a wonderful surfer. And you have all the right equipment, the right wetsuit, the right surfboard. Your, your surfboard is waxed or whatever people do to their surfboards to get them ready. And you have taken yourself to the ocean's edge, the perfect time of day. So you have done your part. Your equipment is ready. Your physical body is ready. And you are at the ocean's edge. But you know what part you have no dominion over is the state of the ocean. That there are times that the ocean is still and good waves are not available. So no matter how good a surfer you are, you're not going to catch the big wave if the big wave has not been created yet. 
And I think sometimes in this life, we think we are responsible for the waves as well. We're co-creating in a multi-dimensional universe. And there are times that the creation energy is powerful. And there are times when it is quiet. One of my teachers says, and I love this quote from her, it's from Mary Holnick at the University of Santa Monica. She says, there is a difference between incubation and inertia. And I have come to learn to discern the two because I certainly have experienced a lot of inertia in my life as well. But there are times when I am called to go into a pause. I might be tired. I might be irritable. I might not feel the flicker of inspiration or drive to get anything done. And I've learned to be okay with that because at some point, the pilot light is ignited and I'm ready to go. So I invite you to really look at your own creation cycles. Your creation cycle will be personal to you. Just because your partner or best friend is someone who gets 25 things done in a day, it doesn't mean that this is your style. I'm a steeper. I steep with things. I think about them. I roll around with them. I am typically not a person who rushes into action quickly. I'm not saying that's good or bad. It just is. There are times I'm very spontaneous, but I've learned to be patient with the part of me that steeps. I was working with a friend who was my coach for a while and we would have these big revelations and I would leave a session with this list of things like this is the answer. And the next week there would be this expectation that I would have taken action and I never did. I was like, I'm still steeping. It's just my style. And I've learned to have patience with my own process. I remember years ago, I went to a training with a friend. It was a training about social media. And it was a two-day training. So we left the first day profoundly inspired with lots of ideas. And I went home inspired and I had dinner and I watched television. My friend went home and she redid her website and she shifted things on social media <laughs> and we met up the next morning and she had done all of this. And I said, when did you do that? She said, last night. I said, oh, I said, I had a lean cuisine and I watched television. <laughs> this is the difference between us. And I've come to learn not to judge this part of me. I've learned to be patient in the way I steep, in the way I attune, in the way I coax myself forward. Because the drill sergeant approach has never ever worked for me. I just dig my heels in and resist all the more. I like to be coaxed, whether it's coaxing from the angels or the universe or a treat at the end of the day. I do really well with the reward system of something delightful being seated for me. So I invite you to take a deep breath in 
and allow this beautiful angelic light to flow to you. And perhaps while you're drifting off, you can gently contemplate your relationship with patience, especially as it relates to your co-creation style, your co-creation archetype. The creative spirit needs time. You know, here we are, we are these miraculous beings with this vast consciousness that can dream up more than we can ever implement in a lifetime, never mind a day. And so there is this delicious opportunity to be in the expansiveness of consciousness, to wander through the opportunities and the potentials, and then allow them to take form in such a way that we can dance with them on the earth plane. I love that process of creation. So be patient, be patient with yourself, be patient with your process. And be patient with the co-creative wisdom of this universe as you shift into the new adventures and opportunities that are calling to you. And so I share this beautiful wisdom with you, inviting you into a place of reflection, continuing to receive this beautiful, healing, divine light from your team of angels who love you so. And I invite you to rest, rest into the love, rest into the soothing, calming energies the angels are bringing to you now. And while you rest, my beautiful friend, I'm going to read to you as we wander through the pages of an old magazine together. So for this story time, I am guided to go into the Wayback Machine with you, and we are going to go through the pages of Good Housekeeping from 1908. So just to set the stage, women still do not have the right to vote. They will not get this until 1920. So a lot of these articles are about the changing role of women You know, if they're going to go to college, keeping a tidy house, taking care of the children. And perhaps I'll read some of those articles, but one that I find really interesting is a series that they're doing on model residence towns. I read one, I don't know, a month or two ago about Pasadena. That was one of the articles in the series. And this one is about Boulder, Colorado. Now, I've never spent any time in Boulder. I've only spent a tiny amount of time in Denver. But as I've shared before, here in the United States, a lot of the cities here that have been developed have only been developed in this way for a very short period of time. And I'm really fascinated how some of these cities came to be So I thought we could read this article together and learn a little bit more about this part of Boulder's history. So it says, Boulder, a progressive mountain town, and this is written by Cora Curtis Long. It's the fifth in a series of model residence towns. They've also taken a look at Pasadena. 
um, Richmond, Indiana, Wellesley, Massachusetts, and Augusta, Georgia. So if you want to hear any of those others, I've already done Pasadena, but I will look up those articles for you and be happy to include those in a future episode of the podcast. So we start off, it says, on a broad tableland at the base of the Rockies, our beautiful Colorado town unites the wealth of the mountains with the riches of the plains. To the west, so close that a few of the houses seem almost to cling to their abrupt sides, the foothills rise with stupendous strides toward the great range of perpetually snow-capped peaks. To the east stretches the vast level of the plain, broken here and there by shimmering lakes, everywhere in its very colored offerings of fruits, grains, and vegetables, attesting to the wonderful productivity of its soil. The mountains furnish a plentiful supply of water, which is distributed over the valley by means of a splendid irrigation system, thus making crop failure a thing unknown here. Boulder possesses all the advantages of a mountain town and is without the disadvantages. With a population of about 12,000, it has three railroads, besides an excellent electric interurban service with Denver 29 miles to the southeast. Its own electric streetcar system connects the most important parts of the place. Almost purely residential, it is the home of a high class of citizens. There is no slum problem to be solved, no smoke nuisance to be settled, and yet, unlike so many residence towns, Boulder offers a home to the man who must labor with his hands. Recent rapid growth has caused the carpenter, the painter, the brick and stonemason to be in demand. Close about the town there is much fruit growing, much vegetable gardening, many poultry farms. Any of these offer a comfortable maintenance to the man who works scientifically and earnestly. The mines and quarries, both in mountain and valley, supply additional means of support. The natural resources which Boulder has at command are almost unbelievable to the stranger. The plain is rich not only agriculturally and horticulturally, but abounds in mineral wealth as well. Fine building stone, good coal, high-grade oil, and natural gas are all abundant. Clay for making brick and stone for cement also occur. Stone is a material considerably in evidence in the buildings, and the supply is practically inexhaustible. The oil fields are being rapidly developed, the large daily output of oil being excellent grade. Gold, silver, tungsten, zinc, lead, and copper form a very material part of our natural wealth. Gold, silver, and tungsten are especially prevalent, the mountain lands about Boulder being the greatest tungsten-producing region in the world. From the mountains come an unimpeachable supply of drinking water. To them, too, we look for water power. The restless, dashing waters of Boulder Creek are now being harnessed to run one of the largest electric power plants in the United States. Surely the healthful, energizing atmosphere must be looked upon as a resource, with its 326 days of sunshine, cool summers, and mild winters, it seldom fails to meet the needs of any who come. The withering heat of lower altitudes is a thing unknown here. Even during the warmest part of the year, the nights are invariably cool and restful. The zero point is reached but a few times during the winter. People can very comfortably live in tents the year through. Boulder is a veritable bower of verdure during the summer months. Verdue, that's not a word you hear very often anymore. 
This enhancement of her natural charms the town owes to the good taste of the inhabitants. This enhancement of her natural charms the town owes to the good taste of the inhabitants and to the eternal vigilance of the tree commissioner. Careful inspection is maintained that no infected trees be brought into the district to menace the safety of existing tree life. A sharp watch is kept, and attacks of plant pests are checked in their incipiency. Boulder has 2,000 acres of public parks. The largest of these is a government grant of 1,600 acres of natural mountain park. The foothills are well timbered with conifers, which are practically free from the ravages of insect life. Rainbow and mountain trout and other fish add much to the pleasure of an excursion. The town itself, with its protective ordinances, is a veritable mecca for songbirds. Boulder has solved the constant problem of pure water in a unique manner. 5,000 feet above the city and 20 miles to the west in the heart of the snowy range stand the bases of those rugged mountains known as the Arapaho Peaks. High along their sides, and reaching almost to their pinnacles, lies the Arapaho Glacier, the only true glacier in the state. Almost 200 acres of solid ice it is, torn here, and there in deep crevices moving downward at the rate of 17 to 27 feet yearly. At the foot of the Arapaho Peaks and fed by this glacier extends a chain of lakes comprising 250 acres of clear, cool water high above all sources of pollution or contamination. The entire watershed with the lakes themselves is the property of the city. The water is conducted to the town by four steel pipelines not long since completed at a cost of $200,000. A recent examination of this water by a Chicago chemist shows it is 99.996% pure. Well, it would be interesting to hear what the status of that is these days with all the water shortages. But it was a time of golden possibilities back then, I suppose, where nature seemed plentiful, right? a different time and a different consciousness, but I'll keep going. Milk and cream are obtained from a number of dairy farms not far from the city. These are under the supervision of a dairy commissioner whose duty it is to inspect carefully all dairies and dairy products. So I'm going to skip that part. Um, oh, okay, this might be of interest, the matter of garbage, because this is part of urban planning, right? How do we get rid of all the stuff? <laughs> so the matter of garbage is under the supervision of the city teams being employed for its daily removal. The sewage accommodations have of late years been only partially complete because of the rapid extension of the town on all sides. These are being greatly enlarged and extended during the present year. As rapidly as the sewer lines are completed, sewage connection is enforced. When the plans now underway, Finnish Boulder will have a highly efficient modern drainage system. Small wonder is it that the town has acquired an enviable reputation as a health center To this place come the ill and exhausted to breathe in health and strength with the ozone-laden, pine-scented air. With a well-equipped, well-organized, paid fire department, three fire stations in different parts of the town, and an abundant supply of water under high pressure, a fire seldom reaches the point of destructiveness. Saloons were voted out two years ago, and the integrity and acumen of the administration have been such that we have a prohibition which prohibits the sale of intoxicants. Consequently, we have no disorderly element, and our police force is small, one chief and four patrolmen being found adequate. 
Exceptional educational advantages are offered here. The public school management is healthfully progressive and wide awake. At present, we have nine fine stone and brick school buildings with over 50 teachers and are building on an average one school building every two years. Boulder is fitly named the Athens of Colorado, for it is the home of state preparatory schools and the state university. The fact that these two large institutions are here has a determining influence on the character of our community. The public has not been slow to recognize the advantages obtainable, and every year families from all parts of the United States make this place their home, that their children may profit by the educational facilities so uniformly and exceptionally good from the lowest grades of the public school up and to and through the graduate department of the university. The Boulder Carnegie Library and the large library of the State University are counted not the least of Boulder's attractions by many of her citizens. And I just have to say, an aside, I want to do some research into the Carnegie Libraries. I'm reading a really lovely book right now called Lost Friends, and they're talking about how this small town got a grant to have a Carnegie Library. And I thought, I want to learn more about that. So maybe in another episode, we will explore Carnegie Libraries. So the Boulder Carnegie Library and the large library of the State University are counted not the least of Boulder's attractions by many of her citizens. The Texas, Colorado Chautauqua grounds lie to the south on an ascending slope, which gradually rises several hundred feet and then falls quickly away into a pine-timbered, vine-grown glen. Here thousands come yearly to rejuvenate physically and mentally. From May till October, the cottages are well filled with tourists from all the states in the Union, while during the Chautauqua proper, which begins July 4th and lasts six weeks, the white-tented city which springs up evidences the popularity of the program. Boulder has 11 churches and a new $40,000 YMCA building. In the southeastern part of the town is the University Hospital. The Place Sanitarium is near the center, while the grounds of the Colorado Sanitarium lie toward the northern edge. The tasteful, well-kept houses, smooth lawns, and clean streets with their sparkling mountain water coursing along through stone gutters have not failed to influence for the better the lives of the residents, nor to add to the pleasure of our sojourners. Professor Richard Moulton of the University of Chicago says, I do not know that I have ever seen so much good taste in the architecture of private dwelling houses in any single place. With an excellent grade of coal at about $4 per ton delivered, and a correspondingly cheap supply of natural gas, the question of heating is by no means a terrifying one, especially when one considers that the townsman often eats his New Year's dinner out of doors, so summer-like are many of the winter days. Food supplies average about the same in price as in the Mississippi Valley region. Clothing may be secured at correspondingly reasonable rates. And then the article abruptly ends. So it's always interesting to hear how they describe these towns and their developments back then through their perspective. And and certainly now we know a lot more than we did back then. But I just thought that that was an interesting little tidbit to share with you. But let's find some more articles we can read together. Okay, how is this article, The Mysteries of Lingerie, from the Perception Filter of 1908, (laughs) written by Isabel Gordon Curtis, again in Good Housekeeping, 1908. So one morning, I watched a pretty girl busy with a bodkin, I don't know what that is, 
and a roll of ribbon threading into her underwear the silk tie strings which fashion demands. Piece after piece of fresh laundry was laid aside ready for wear, but every inch of ribbon that adorned it was snowy white. You don't run to color, do you? I asked. Never, answered the girl emphatically. Never since I saw May Robinson in the rejuvenation of Aunt Mary. That was an awful object lesson. Sorry, the birds are going crazy out here. <laughs> A little extra ambience for your listening pleasure. Before that, I made my lingerie gorgeous with blue, pink, even yellow ribbon. When I saw Aunt Mary drop her kimono and step out in a bewildering fluff of lace-trimmed, ribbon-adorned lingerie, I lost my breath for a second. She was the most ridiculous old object you can imagine. If she could only have been satisfied with baby blue ribbon, but no, she flounced about the stage with yards of ribbon, two inches wide, fluttering about her, ribbon crimson as rambler rose. The old lady, after sixty, quiet, unfashionable years in her country home, goes, you know, for a visit to New York, and comes back rejuvenated, not only in soul but in wardrobe, manners, even morals. Her up-to-date lingerie was the limit. She had brought the most exaggerated styles in the shops. No wonder they scared her staid old servant into a fit. It was nothing but a clever bit of comedy, Still, it must have set a lot of women in the audience thinking, as it did me. They saw what guise they had made of themselves with splashes of bright ribbon showing through transparent waists. It must have been some kind of burlesque show, I, I imagine. Um, okay, so, so we'll keep going. <laughs> the girl was right. It only requires the multitude to seize a fashion pretty and refined in itself to make it grotesque, so much so it stamped out of existence or else relegated to such a stage of simplicity as the hoi polloi would never imitate. This sort of thing goes on constantly like a cycle in the world of fashion. Here, said a French woman who runs a trousseau shop in a big city, here is the most chic thing in corsets. She laid before me the daintiest girdle imaginable, made of white satin, powdered with embroidered rosebuds and pinks and greens of such delicacy they fairly faded into the background. And that, I queried, pointing to another corset of radiant yellow satin, splashed with purple pansies. Ah, that, the Frenchwoman shrugged in a gesture of disgust. Ah, that horrible. Only we have all sorts of customers. When a lady comes in, I know at once whether she wants the extinguished rosebud or the flamboyant pansy. I never mistake. The woman who buys the pansy corset exclaims, It is so chic, so French. French indeed. Did you ever study the beautiful brocade of Marie Antoinette days? Delicate blue and yellow, so subdued, it is the soft blue sky and half-clouded sunshine, or flowers so delicately lovely that they are a joy forever. These are truly French, French of the old nobility. Still, to some Americans, the more vulgar and gorgeous a thing is, the Frenchier they call it. Here is lingerie, I call truly French. The woman tossed before me, one after another of the daintiest garments imaginable, filmy linen, hosiery hand-embroidered or made of exquisite lace. I glanced at the price tags. Each bit of lingerie cost as much as it would have provided a fall wardrobe for an economical woman. Gracious, I exclaimed, do you sell many of these? Well, there are seasons when it is almost impossible to fill orders. During early spring and fall, the bride comes shopping. Unless she orders months ahead, we have either to disappoint her or keep our women so hard at work it means overstrain of the eyes and nerves. Here's a wild rose set. It costs $358. Oh, 
Wow, that was a lot of money back then. The Lily of the Valley set is $300. I had never seen such exquisite needlework. Along the edges of each garment were set sprays of wild roses, the petals filled with lace while leaves and stems were in delicate stitchery. Lilies of the valley bordered the other set, sprays of leaves, graceful stems, and bell-like blossoms were tossed here and there in profusion, then cut out with a charm of irregularity as real as the blossom itself. I hinted at extravagance. Ah, do not be one more woman to maim the rich for spending their money, cried the little French woman. Unless you are in the business, you cannot guess what a boon this work is for the woman who has to earn a living by her needle. We provide work all the year round and pay good prices to women of refinement. Fifty years ago, a girl was taught to sew beautifully. A machine never touched one of these garments. Every seam was sewn by hand. The middle-class woman cultivates a taste for clothes far beyond her means and imitates the lingerie of the rich at the lowest possible price. Her demand is catered to by the department store. She is speaking the truth when she tells of buying underwear for less than the goods would have cost. I have seen bargain counters heaped high with lingerie that sold at actually no margin to speak of. Many a poor soul toiled day and night to make such bargains possible, earning barely a shelter and bread. Let the rich woman spend her money as lavishly as she will. She is providing comfort and employment in many a home. Corsets and underwear were not the only lovely things in the trousseau shop. There were bridal petticoats of white brocade satin with scalloped flounces of white Spanish lace and ruffles of chiffon beneath. One of these cost as much as an entire outfit of underwear. Then you could imagine nothing so fascinating as tea jackets and kimonos of painted chiffon, exquisite as a butterfly's wing and almost as fragile. Here's the most expensive corset in my shop, said the French woman. It costs $360. Okay, and I figured at this point, you might be curious as to what that translates to today. So I just Googled it, and $360 is equivalent to 11700 and something dollars today. So that gives you a sense. So this beautiful course that I'll keep reading... It was made of exquisite brocade touched with ribbon rosettes and real lace. But what set the price spinning away was a half a dozen diamonds set in the gold clasps. When it went on the window of the trousseau shop, even men stopped in a half-abstracted, half-apologetic fashion to look at it. A Washington woman tells of finding a certain Persian minister spellbound before the display of lingerie. I would never have dreamed of finding you here, she cried. What interests you? The corsets, madam, he answered naively. I was thinking by what wonderful means the American woman adds to her beauty. Our women, and there are no lovelier women in the world, cannot understand the beauty of the corset. They call them steel prisons and they are so plump they require them. If they could only see these, they would be converted. The story is told of another diplomat, a Frenchman who fell desperately in love with a beautiful Washington girl. She treated him coldly. There was a kindly American matron to whom he frequently turned for guidance in the ethics of a new civilization. On Christmas afternoon he appeared, the picture of dismay and unhappiness. Ah, dear madam, he cried, she has given me the terrible rebuff. She has said without words, I do not love you. What has happened now? I sent her a Christmas gift, the loveliest gift I could find. I enclosed a note telling her how dearly I loved her. In half an hour, the box was returned with a message that she could not accept such a gift. Well, what did you send her? Corsets, the most beautiful corsets I could find. 
Why, my dear boy, you should never have sent such a thing as that to a lady. No American girl could accept such a gift from a man. It would not be exactly proper. Proper, cried the perplexed diplomat. Why not proper? (laughs) Do you think that really happened? I don't know. Okay, it's an anecdote, perhaps. A lady in my country would have been perfectly charmed. They were not ordinary corsets. They cost sixty dollars. Still, they were not a proper gift, said his friend emphatically. Our American civilization may be queer in spots. Still, it has produced a type of woman quite different from the French woman. Even she is prudish today in comparison with her great-grandmother, to whom the making of a toilette was the event of a day. She sat in a boudoir An exquisite negligee held receptions for her men friends while she was being painted, powdered, and patched. And that brings us to the end of that article. Oh my God, I am so happy I incarnated after the age of corsets. I would be so crabby all the time. (laughs) Have you watched things like The Gilded Age and you know, where women are sort of boned into these garments that restrict breathing. I I couldn't have done it. This was, this is a good era, I think, now. At least for me. <laughs> My how things have changed, huh? So thank you for letting me share these articles with you. A little bit of insight to the lingerie of the day, as well as what was happening in Boulder, Colorado. And perhaps by now you are off having the sweetest of dreams. So I'm so grateful for our time together. Thank you for allowing me to share this time with you. You are very precious in this world. And I am always grateful for our time together. So you rest well. And we will talk again soon. And if you're still wide awake and you need some more content, there are over 130 episodes in the archive. So just go ahead and queue one up and I will continue rambling and meandering and keeping you company. So thank you so much. Sweet dreams.